Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome back to our class. Uh, this is going to be class 10, I believe, in our series on uh, God's sovereignty and human freedom and responsibility. Very, uh, very easy, non-controversial type of thing we we're looking at here. <laughs> you never know what to expect. But um, let's just have a prayer, and then I want to pick it up right where we left off in the last class, and we'll ask for God's blessing here, okay? Let's pray. Our dear, blessed, and holy God of heaven, we thank you, dear, blessed creator, in Jesus' precious name. Uh, Lord, thank you for creating us and saving us and calling us to believe in you. Thank you, God, for redemption and salvation, for the hope of heaven. Thank you for the new birth. And uh, Lord, thank you for everything in our lives that make us smile and give us hope. And we thank you so much for your precious word that shines like a light in a dark place. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who authored the Bible, who, who opens its pages to us. And we pray, Almighty God, in Jesus' name, that the Spirit of God would be here tonight uh, to open the Word to us and to open our hearts and minds to the Word uh, so that, uh, Lord, we would grow in grace and we would be more capable, faithful, courageous ambassadors for Jesus. And, uh, Lord, we ask you to please accept these prayers now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Okay, guys, well, where we left off, well, just as a quick uh, recap here. Now, throughout the course, I have been, <laughs> I've been insisting in the course that uh, God loves the world. I believe God loves the world, and uh, God reveals truth to everyone, and God enables people to respond affirmatively to the truth. And we were looking at certain passages of Scripture uh, to support those assertions. And Cornelius was a good object lesson. Remember, the man was not saved, and yet he did get a good report card from God. His good works, his prayers, his almsgiving, and all that had come up before God as a memorial to him. And the angel appeared to Cornelius in uh, Acts chapter 10 and recounted in Acts 11. The angel said to Cornelius, uh, send for Peter, who will give you words by which you must be saved. So now we know Cornelius was an unregenerate man, and yet he was enabled by God to respond affirmatively to truth. And uh, I just suggest that God does that for everybody. Uh, if, you, if you respond affirmatively, you get more truth. If you don't, God's under no obligation to give you more truth. And I do think God loves the world, and, I, and when I've turned to passages like 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse 4, where it says God wills all men to be saved, and, and passages like that. But uh, at, the end of our, at the end of last class, um, Brother Nate had drawn our attention to Proverbs 16 and verse 4. And this sort of goes counter to what I was teaching, that God loves the world and creates people to be saved, not damned. But let's look at Proverbs 16, 4, and let's see if we can uh, understand what's being said here. Proverbs 16 and verse 4. Okay, Proverbs 16, 4 reads, The Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. And if we keep reading, I think we should read into verse 5. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. Now that sounds pretty heavy duty. The Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. I think the old King James says the day of evil, but I, I got a new King James that says day of doom. Okay, what does it mean? Someone offer a suggestion. What are, what's he talking about here? <laughs> Come on, we had a whole week. <laughs> what is it? What's the obvious? What do you think? Is there an obvious meaning here? Go ahead. If you don't believe it, go to hell. Well, that's that runs all the way through the Bible, right? You got to believe. But go ahead, Prudence. I think that it just shows that he has a purpose for everybody, even the evil, and it all works towards what he's got planned. God definitely has a purpose for everyone. That's true. <coughs> Are we to take from this verse that God creates certain people to be wicked and then damn them? Is yeah. that what we? Oh, I don't think so. Just will still use what they do. He'll still use them. Use them? Well, kind of like, you know, like Pharaoh, right? Yeah. Harden his heart so that Israel would move on like they were supposed to. That's right, yeah. And so what I mean is that not that he made evil people, but that he still has a purpose, and whatever they do is going to work towards his purpose. I think we could all agree to that. 
God creates people and they all have a purpose. And God's going to work all these things together for the purposes of greater good, we believe. A maximally great being would operate like that. I think we could glean that from the Bible. But is this verse saying that God um, makes wicked people to doom them no. or, or to damn no, them? No. It's saying <laughs> that the Lord makes all people for himself and inevitably some of them are going to choose to be bad. Yeah. And so they're going to end up being bad for them. They're going to go to hell. And God knows who. But he didn't turn them that way. That's their choice. I think I could agree with that. And I could agree with what you're saying there, May. God yeah. knows what we're going to do. So people. God made everything, right? God made the whole world. And he made um, all the people on it, even the people who are wicked and do wickedly on the earth, right? But it does, it does look like there's some intentionality here it looks like the wicked are in some way, uh, in, in some proximity to this day of doom. And it looks like they're appointed for doom. It kind of looks like that. Uh, my eyes have been colored by Calvinistic thinking too. And I kind of see that there when I first read this. Because even though I'm not reformed in my theology, there is a bit of momentum in that kind of thinking. So I have to do some uh, searching of the scriptures um, to really flesh out this verse, to compare Scripture with Scripture, this is what you must do. The Bible's its own best interpreter, right? So if you go now, you know, you look at this, God creates the wicked for the day of doom. Go to the book of Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah chapter 13 to start with. Jeremiah 13. Just very quickly here. Maybe this will be helpful to you. I hope it's helpful. Okay, Jeremiah 13. Okay. Now, you all know the story of Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah is operating approximately 600 years BC. Israel is on, the, or I should say Judah, is on the cusp of a Babylonian invasion, right? Uh, Judah has been uh, casting God's law behind itself, uh, Willingly, knowingly, deliberately transgressing against the known will of God. And Jeremiah has been trying to warn these people. You better stop it. You better repent. And they're not listening to him. In fact, they abuse Jeremiah. And uh, they treat him very shabbily. But in chapter 13 of Jeremiah's prophecy, look in verse 9. It says, Thus says the Lord, In, it, in this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So you remember in Proverbs 16, verse 4 talked about the wicked for the day of doom, and then verse 5 went on to prescribe against the proud, right? Verse 15 here in Jeremiah 13, Hear and give ear, do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God. Then in verse uh, 17, But if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears, because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. So very clearly, uh, Jeremiah is sort of pleading with these people, stop this um, proud rebellion against God because you're going to get spanked hard, right? Well, now go please to Jeremiah uh, chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 19. This is all going to come together, I promise. <laughs> 16, 19. Jeremiah 16, verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? He calls God his strength and fortress uh, and his refuge in the day of affliction. He's looking ahead to the Babylonian invasion, right? We all know that. But look now, please, at chapter 17 and verse 17. And here's where we bring it together. 17, 17. Do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. Now, that, that's that phrase from Proverbs 16, 4, the day of doom. It's the only place in the Bible other than Proverbs 16, 4 where you find that phrase. This is it. Jeremiah 17. You are my hope in the day of doom. Let them be ashamed to persecute me, but do not let me be put to shame, 
Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom. I think the Bible's inviting us to put the two passages together. The Proverbs 16, verse 4, has the phrase day of doom. The only other place in all the Bible you see that is right here. It looks like the day of doom has to do with the Babylonian uh, conquest, invasion of Judah. And the wicked there in Proverbs 16 and verse 4, the wicked is singular, that wicked one. And I'm suggesting that that wicked one that God has prepared for the day of doom is Nebuchadnezzar. He is that wicked one prepared by God to come and spank Judah. It's not consigning someone to hell or damnation or something. It's God preparing a wicked person to exact some punishment on his people. And in in fact, um, that Hebrew phrase, harasha, wicked one, uh, that is an epithet for Nebuchadnezzar in the rabbinic writings. I have uh, three, so- three rabbinic sources that all designate Nebuchadnezzar that wicked one. Harasha, that's, that's the phrase there from Proverbs 16.4. So that's another take on, on the 16th proverb. I think it's correct. You can think it through, uh, meditate on it this week, but I'm just inviting us all to dig deeper into the scriptures and let scripture interpret scripture. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, the, way, the way it's worded, that, like you said, does kind of lean in that direction um, with, uh, the, with the wicked and the day of doom there, but then like right, uh, right after that, you know, he, he says, and none will go unpunished. It, it, just doesn't say, it just doesn't seem to lean in the direction of making sense that he would create this wicked one and then, and, and, and then punish him. Like, why, why would he punish something that... Well, that, I think that, God can do anything... I mean, right, it just, but... It doesn't seem to make... It doesn't make much sense to me, but at the same time, God can do anything he wants, yeah. right? Yeah. And we're trying to figure out what is it that God wants? How is God operating? And I'm just suggesting that we dig into the Bible <coughs> and let the Bible interpret the Bible. Mm-hmm. So that phrase, the day of doom, the fact that it's only found in two places, it's either the Proverbs and then it's Jeremiah, one verse apart. I think we're being directed there. And that wicked one... I suggest, is Nebuchadnezzar. And he does have that epithet, um, according to the Jews. So that's just a little something there. Um, And you don't just catch that a five-minute reading, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Kev first, and then Uva. Yeah? Just in in Jeremiah 25, which I find interesting, Nebuchadnezzar is described as my servant. Right. Yep. He's going to do what God wants him to do. (laughs) And at the same time, by the way, the, if, if the wicked one in Proverbs 16.4 is Nebuchadnezzar, he gets saved. <laughs> right? In Daniel 4, he looks like a saved man. So, go ahead, Uva. Yeah, I was uh, just trying, trying to draw some attention to John 17, verse 12, when the Lord is praying for his disciples. Yeah. And he says there, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction yeah. so that scripture would be fulfilled. Yeah. So that seems to me that Judas was doomed to destruction right from the beginning. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> I'm not going to tackle that one right now. Go ahead. Just uh, in... in to deal directly with Proverbs 16. Yeah. I, I think it's a bit of a stretch to make it out that the wicked is, is only Nebuchadnezzar, especially when you brought in verse 5 where he does say everyone, which is there's a plurality there, mm-hmm. who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And if you even take even further back and forward in the context, he starts in verse 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Oh yeah, we'll cover that verse yet, but not today. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but, but did you I, see I, I, like I how much this. time we had to spend on one verse? So I can't be jumping around all over right. the place. But right. go ahead. Um, but I just see this more comprehensively in Scripture than just Nebuchadnezzar. I would point to Isaiah 10 with Assyria there as they've conquered and taken over Israel. Mm-hmm. And God speaks to the, the king of Israel, Assyria sorry, and says, You've become arrogant in your heart. Who are you as the axe to boast over your beholder, mm-hmm. as, the, as the staff to boast over um, its wielder? Right, and he speaks in in the same terminology there. I think, and it, it seems a lot more comprehensive than just to one specific yeah, scenario. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm just addressing the verse that was brought up, 
I've made the case. You can go home and meditate on that and take it or leave it. Um, I think there's something here. Can I add to one to the verse that I brought up? Yeah. That I support with an argument. Sure. Um, in Exodus 9.15 and Exodus 14.17, God said, I've created Pharaoh for this very purpose and yeah. then he destroyed him. Right. And he says, I created one, I made one vessel to honor, one vessel yeah, to honor. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Jacob I love, he said, hey. Yeah, yeah. We will look at all those verses, my brother. But yeah. Pharaoh, he created him for that very purpose, yeah. to destroy him. I'm not sure he created him to destroy him. Yes. We will look at Pharaoh when we get into Romans 9. Okay. We will look at Pharaoh in detail. But anyway, I, we need to get back to... Um, <laughs> I want to talk about being dead in trespasses and sins. This is a favorite. <laughs> we'll see how we do. Um, I made the case that, first of all, faith, the exercise of faith in God precedes regeneration. And I gave a whole whack ton of verses around the back of the board. And then we did look at Cornelius, and we saw that he was not regenerated when he was uh, putting faith in God. So the, the rejoinder now is, well, what about being dead in sins and trespasses? So remember Ephesians 2 says that we were all spiritually dead in that way. And the word dead in Greek, nekros, does mean, its primary meaning means dead, like a corpse. But it can be used literally or figuratively in the scriptures. That's, you pick up any concordance and it'll tell you that. So I'm going to suggest that when the Bible says we're dead in sins and trespasses, it does not mean inability to respond affirmatively to truth. It means rather, number one, it means living a useless uh, life of frivolity, uh, of futility. It just means that. You're wasting your life. You're wasting your time. I think that's the primary meaning in the scriptures. And secondly, it does denote separation. It denotes, um, like if someone were to walk out of your life and say goodbye forever, it's like that person's dead, because when a person dies, they're gone out of your life. So, but both of those meanings that you do see in the scriptures do not denote inability, right? They, they just don't. So I'm going to give you, this comes from Moulton and Milligan's vocabulary of the Greek New Testament, and they're looking at the, that word death, necros. And this is the quote from this, um, this standard reference work. It says, quote, this, The Christian spirit which objected to free enjoyment of life for self and friends is stigmatized as death in life. And this was the view of a non-Christian. His name was Menogenes Eustethenes. I'll try to write that down here so you can... If you want to write it down, you can look it up for yourself. Uh, he's a non-Christian. Monogenes. Uh, let's see if I got, make sure I write it properly here. E-U-S-C. There. He's a, an Epicurean philosopher. And he said, living a Christian life, that's death in life. Why aren't you living for enjoyment? Like, why aren't you enjoying yourselves? He, he, was, uh, he was wanting people to um, live for pleasure. Like, not sensual pleasure, but live for pleasure, right? That's the Epicurean philosophy. And he called that death, death in life, if you're not living for pleasure, see? Now, you also have um, another, you have a Christian now, Commodianus. And he's writing about AD 240 or so, and he's got the exact opposite thing to say. And this is what he says. He says, they are vain joys. Oh, he says, they are vain joys with which thou art foolishly delighted. Do not these make thee to be a man dead? So they're both using the term kind of the same way. They're saying, if you don't live for something meaningful, you're like dead while you're alive. The Christian says, live for Jesus or you're dead while you're alive. The other guy says, don't live for Jesus or you're dead while you're alive. But both guys see leading a useless life as being uh, dead even while you're living. And the Apostle Paul actually uses the term the exact same way in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5 and verse 6. And he says, now he's speaking of the ladies in the church. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. She that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. So that is, you're leading a life that's useless, you're wasting time, 
you're not doing anything meaningful with your resources. And so Paul's using it in that way. And we have the non-Christian and the Christian uh, in the early centuries of the church. They're using it that way. But um, can we please, let's look at Luke chapter 15. I'd like us to read this together, Luke 15. And this is very familiar to us, right? This is um, an amazing chapter, Luke 15, where the Lord Jesus tells three stories, remember? He tells a story about a man who has a herd of sheep, and he loses one of them. One of them wanders off, and he searches high and low until he finds it, and when he finds it, he brings it home, and he says, Rejoice with me, I found the thing that was lost. And he says in verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And then he tells another little story about a woman who uh, had a pile of coins and she lost one coin. So she had to sweep her house looking for it. And when she found it, she said, Rejoice with me, I found the peace that I lost. And Jesus says, Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It kind of sounds like um, heaven becomes a happy place when people are saved. I, didn't, I never did find a place where God is terribly happy about someone being damned. If, that, if such a passage exists, you can show me. I don't think I've ever found one ambiguous passage uh, to that effect. But uh, here, let's just look at this parable here that Jesus tells. Verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to, and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. But he arose and came to his father. But when, the father, uh, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I make, make, make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And that's for emphasis right there. There you have it. Uh, twice, the, that prodigal son twice is pronounced dead because number one, he's wasting his life, prodigal living, and number two, he's separated from his father, right? But obviously it can't denote inability because we're told that he came to himself and came back to his father. It just can't, it cannot be um, a rock solid, watertight case that dead, being dead in sins means you're unable not especially when you think about all that we've seen thus far in our course. I'll ask a question, though. 
if the Calvinist perspective on uh, regeneration preceding faith were true, how might this parable have been different? That you wouldn't have the prodigal son coming to himself and then running home. You'd have him fainting. He would be completely comatose. The father would have to go pick him up and carry him home, right? And nurse him back to health and strength. I think it might be different. The prodigal son was saved before he left home. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Absolutely. Well, he was a son. He was gracious. He was already part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Any one of those parables that yeah. you mentioned was talking about loss of something that they already had. The shepherd had sheep, and one of his sheep he lost. Yeah. The person with the coins had coins, and one of her coins she lost. Right? So you could have the argument that um, God has set aside people that he is predestined for salvation, and those will be saved. And, and when, yeah. they, when they go astray, when they are lost, then he will save them. It seems to me all three parables are related, right? Yeah. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son, right? In the first, at the end of the first two parables, we are told very clearly that there's rejoicing when a sinner repents. That sounds like lost people finding forgiveness and salvation to me. That's how I read that. And you can check your favorite, like, reformed guys and see what they say about that. When David was lost, in a sense, when God hides his face for him in Psalm 51, and then he repented, God rejoiced him. You, we'll have to decide how we want to read this. I, I would submit to you, I think you're reading this through reformed glasses, and I'm asking you to just try to just let the text talk to you. It looks to me like the salvation of sinners to me. It looks like conversion to me. Especially since the, at the end of the first two, we are told very clearly there's rejoicing in heaven over the repentance of sinners. Repentance of sinners, right? God commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere to repent. And there's rejoicing when they do. That doesn't sound like someone who's, who was saved and who wandered off to me. Well, that's not how I meant that. Okay. So what I'm saying is that God has set aside a certain number, a certain people. Okay. I see. And he says, these are mine, right? But before they're saved, of course, they're not, they, they, they don't belong to Oh, them. I see. Okay, so you're seeing this par these parables, you're seeing through the lens of unconditional election. Yeah. So when we get to election and predestination, maybe you'll change your mind. <laughs> when we get to that part of the course. Okay, I understand. I totally get you now. Yeah, I understand. Um, okay, <laughs> and then there's the Lazarus account, right? So oftentimes, those in the Calvinist camp We'll compare what Jesus did for Lazarus with what he does for a sinner who comes to repentance and, and finds salvation. But first of all, we still have to deal with all the passages we looked at where the life was given to people after they exercised faith. The regeneration came after faith. We also have to face the fact that the Bible nowhere uses the Lazarus account that way. In fact, it's the opposite. In John chapter 12, we're told people... Uh, believed in Jesus because they, they saw the miracle. They believed because they saw that. And you see that all the way through the New Testament. John chapter 4, uh, this desperate father of a, of a, a child who was uh, grievously vexed came to Jesus and said, help my son. And Jesus said, unless you see signs and, and miracles, you will by no means believe. So he did the miracle. And then the guy believed and his whole household believed. Same thing in Acts chapter 13 with the case of Sergius Paulus and the sorcerer Bar-Jesus, when Paul struck that guy blind, the proconsul believed. He saw what happened. Okay, there's something supernatural happening here, and he believed. And that maps onto our intuitions on this. And, um, but if you're thoroughly Calvinized, then you're not going to see it, right? You're gonna re you will reinterpret this. And that's okay. I mean, we're all still in the household of faith, but I am just offering... <laughs> Another perspective here, okay? But when Jesus did the miracles, not everyone believed. And those that believed, their eyes were spiritually open. Well, that's... And since the eyes were spiritually open, then they believed. This is the very thing we're debating. You can't assume the thing that you're trying to prove, because that's called arguing in a circle, right? That's the, that's the fallacy of begging the question. So um, the other thing I'll mention here is when it comes to being like dead in sins and trespasses and all that, uh, I'm trying to argue that it does not denote inability... And in fact, the Bible uses sickness um, as an analogy to being sinful, at least as many times as it says we're dead. We're sick, 
right? So if you go to, um, like, say, for example, Isaiah chapter 1. Let's just look at Isaiah 1 for a second here. Isaiah, the first chapter. Okay. Isaiah 1, 4. This is Isaiah the prophet here. He's really laying into his countrymen. Isaiah 1, 4. Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? Will you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and petrifying, putrefying sores they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. So he draws the comparison between being sinful and being grievously sick. And you also see that in Psalm 41.4, where the psalmist asks God, Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. And Jeremiah 17.9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And if you consult a lexicon on that, it just means incurably sick or mortally sick. Um, and you can just check that out. So I think, again, being dead in sins and trespasses, I don't think it um, necessarily denotes inability. And so I'm trying to make the case there on that one. Does that make sense? Uh, you don't have to agree, but do you understand the case that we're trying to make here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, how much time we got left? We got a little bit of time left. So I just want to come back to, uh, we're going to take a running start here at election and predestination. We're going, to, we're going to start this, and this is going to take a while to get through this, because there's no way I'm going to rush through this. Election, predestination. On the Calvinist conception, election and predestination sound to be pretty synonymous. Is that fair? Would you say, Caleb? Election and predestination are pretty near synonyms? Yes, no. Okay, what's so, the so, difference? So election is, is a specified form of predestination okay. re regarding to the salvation of the elect. Okay. Um, but, but predestination is more comprehensive. He's predestined everything that takes place, not just salvation. Okay, thanks. So we all get that? So God predestines everything, and a subset of that would be people predestined for... Uh, salvation, glorification, and all that. So election, predestination, we can put them together. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, on the Calvinist conception, correct me if I'm wrong, but God has unconditionally chosen to save some people and to damn others. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. That's what we believe. Well, that's what the Calvinist reform side <clears throat> believes. Romans 9, 10 to 13 of course, we're going to go verse by verse through Romans, not right now, but, but it says there, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. It, does, it says that right there in the text. Um, and its context there, Romans 9 says that the purpose of God according to election might stand. That's what it says. And it says the children, Jacob and Esau, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil. So on the Calvinist conception based on these verses and how they're being treated, uh, God really doesn't love the world. Not in any, not in any sensible way that I, that I can really understand. Um, it says he hated Esau. Uh, God hates some people before they're born, apparently. And the corollary here is that Jesus did not die for these people. He only died for his elect, which is a late comer, really, in the tulip. The limited atonement comes later, but... Today, it's pretty rock solid, right? God has his elect. Jesus died for them. The rest he has not died for. His blood is not applied to them. It never will be. wasn't intended to be, okay? Does that make sense? I'm not asking you to affirm it, but I think that's, that's clearly the, the Calvinist conception. Now, I reject that. I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, okay? But if I say that, I, I typically get a few responses from people who disagree, Here's the first response that I get. Number one, if Jesus died for all people and all people are not saved, doesn't that mean, number one, uh, God is extending wasted grace on people? 
Number two, is some of his blood wasted? And number three, isn't it more becoming of God that he would come into the world in the person of Jesus as an actual savior and not a potential savior? Now, I've heard John MacArthur say these kinds of things. I've heard MacArthur say, I would rather worship a, an actual savior, not some potential savior. Okay. And I typically, and I get these all the time. I, I hear these things all the time. Maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe those counters to what I believe make sense. That's fine. I do want to draw our attention to something, and it's this. These questions and objections to my position are not coming from the Bible. Uh, these are coming from uh, human opinion. This is philosophy, I think. It seems to me. We have to let the Bible talk to us, and then we have to try to make sense of all these passages, right? But even if Jesus died for the sins of the world, if his blood was spilled for the sins of the world which I believe it says, even if not everyone is saved, his blood is not wasted. That's not wasted blood, right? Because Hebrews 12, I think it's verse 24, says that the blood of Christ speaks better things than that of Abel. Uh, the blood of Jesus testifies to the matchless love of God, that he would send his son into the world to die for sinners. So I, I, don't, I don't see any of these objections um, to limited, like, I don't believe in limited atonement, and I say Jesus loves everyone, right? And I get these objections, but I don't think these objections are scriptural. I don't think they hold, personally. But we're going to look at that in more detail. And then um, the other thing I'll get is, if Jesus died for the whole world, why doesn't everyone go to heaven then? That's another question. Why isn't everyone's sin debt is paid, right? Everyone should go to heaven. And there, I think 1 Timothy 2.4 really... Um, answers the question for me i think it makes a lot of sense first timothy uh chapter two no rather it's chapter four verse ten i don't know if i said that the first time first timothy four ten and i'll get over my my dementia setting in here first timothy four ten listen to what paul says For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. It kind of sounds to me like Jesus died for the sins of the world. And we'll look at many passages that say that. But the saving benefits of what Jesus did won't do you a bit of good unless you appropriate those benefits by faith. So Jesus made the world savable, but you need to appropriate the saving benefits. And your faith is the title deed to those things. I think that's, what's be, that's the only sensible way I can see to make sense out of um, 1 Timothy 4.10. The Savior of all people, especially those who, uh, who believe. And so remember what Jesus said in John 3.19. He said, this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. That's, the con that's why people go to hell. Uh, truth from God reaches those people. They don't like it. They turn their face from it. And they'll be held accountable for what they've done with the truth. And of course, God's truth, God's light came to maximal expression in the person of Jesus. You reject Jesus, um, there's no other recourse for it. What recourse is there? There's none, right? I mean, he is the point of access to God's saving grace. If you reject him, there's no, there's no help for you. So that, Jesus said that's the condemnation. But I'll give you some verse passages you can look up, and we'll see how far we get. But John 1.29, you've got John the Baptist identifying Jesus, and he calls him the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He bears away the sin of the world. In John 6.51, Jesus spoke of his flesh, which he gave for the life of the world. I think it's in John 6, too. I can't remember the exact verse. I don't think I wrote it down here. It's coming to me where Jesus said, he is the true bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You can find that in John 6. I didn't write that one down. 51. Okay, very good. That is 51, yeah. He gives for the life of the world. And then 1 John 2 is as clear as any passage I've ever seen on the, on the topic. 
This is uh, what, what John says in 1 John chapter 2. Uh, in verse 1, he says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That, that's as clear as I think you could ask. I think Jesus died for the world. Uh, 1 John 4.14, 4, we're told the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And then in um, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, you have a nice a stretch of scripture there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse uh, 14, 514. And you go all the way to 19. First, uh, 2 Corinthians, rather. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Let's look at this together here. This is pretty good. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. And we'll read up to verse uh, 19. Okay. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to, him, to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And that would be the gospel. He died for all. We're told there in a, in a couple places. Hebrews 2.9 says that Jesus tasted death for everyone. And in Romans 5.18, we're told very clearly that the free gift came to all men. The free gift came to all men. In... Um, the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 28. Uh, in verse 28, it says, Hebrews 10, 28, Anyone who has rejected Moses' Moses's law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? You're, this is a lost person here, but um, the blood of the covenant was that which sanctified him. See, I, I think that that blood was shed for everybody. And uh, Peter will speak the same way in 2 Peter 2, 1. Uh, he talks about lost people who are damned. He says, they deny the Lord that bought them. That Jesus shed his blood even for them. But they deny the Lord that bought them. In Luke 2, 10... Uh, that angel at the birth of Jesus, uh, he said, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Not some people, but all people. Jesus said in John 12, 32, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. I know John 6, 44 uh, has Jesus saying, uh, no one comes to him except the Father draw him, right? And that just means no one's brilliant enough to do this on their own. We all need help. But I think God is helping people Jesus said in John 16 and verse 8, he would send the Holy Spirit who would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so Hebrews 10 and verses 38 and 39 speaks of people who draw back to perdition. It seems like God is drawing everyone to Christ crucified, but some draw back to perdition. God is drawing people, but some will draw back. And that is the condemnation. Remember... The, the golden text of the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he loved the world. And that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, right? And then Jesus tells us in the, the 19th verse, this is the condemnation, that light has come and men love darkness rather than light. But the Bible does say in John 1, 9, that Jesus is the true light which lightens every man coming into the world. That's like everyone. 
Everyone's receiving light from God, but some are going to deny and suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In Titus 2.11, uh, the Bible says, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God that brings salvation. Now, the old King James has a marginal reading, and it reads like this, uh, the light that bringeth salvation to all men hath appeared. That's even stronger. And the New Matthew Bibles read, reads that way, and the American Standard Version says, light hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Even the ESV, that's a favorite with Reformed uh, theologians. Light has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, it says there. The Geneva Bible says, uh, light that bringeth salvation unto all men has appeared. The New American Standard Bible, uh, light has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Even the New English Translation says that. The Revised Standard says, light has appeared for the salvation of all men. And the Young's Literal says the saving grace of God was manifested to all men. And that is endorsed by Marvin R. Vincent, a Greek scholar, and the Cambridge Bible for schools and universities. So I think a strong case can be made that God loves the world. He really did send his son into the world to make the world savable. And he's enabled everyone to respond affirmatively to truth, but some people just won't do that. They just, they won't. And it'll be on them. Their own damnation will be on them. It's not that God predestined... I don't believe it's that God predestined them for damnation. It looks to me, when we look at all these passages, that God really does love the world. Um, that's a whirlwind tour. I hope you're writing all those verses down. But you can go back in, in the coming week and look at those verse passages and see what they say to you. But uh, that's what they say to me, okay? Any thoughts or questions or comments? Is it John 2.32? Uh, which one did you have there? John two thirty two, and then John uh, twelve thirty two. Twelve. I think yeah, twelve thirty two. I will draw. John six forty four. Yes, no one comes uh, to Christ yeah. except the Father okay. draw him. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, it just it, it just seems to me that the importance of Christ's work on the cross is severely limited if you go from the Calvinist perspective, uh, because well, then he, then 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 he then he is basic, he's basically died for uh, an elected people from all eternity. Like I mean, it just it it it, 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 it seems you can only get his that the maximal importance of it if you if you if you see him as being uh, shedding the blood for, for for the entire world. I do want to talk a little bit about. God is love, right? Twice we're told in, in 1 John, God is love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love suffers long and love is kind, right? Now words mean something. So I suggest that it's not kind to hate a person who has done nothing yet, good or bad. That's not kind to hate someone who hasn't even done anything. It's not kind to refuse to help a person in need when you could. That's not a kind thing to do. Um, Jesus said in John 15, 25, they hated me without a cause, right? And there he's referring to Psalm 69 and verse 4, but he said, they're fulfilling prophecy, they hate me without a cause, but really they have, they have a reason. Uh, you hated them first. <laughs> they could say that to God, you hated me first, you hated me before I was born, like you hated Esau. Pastor, can I just um, talk sure. about that? The reason why yep. God would hate anyone is because of his justice. Because when Adam sinned, God has the right to throw everyone into hell. Mm -hmm. But because of his love and his mercy, he will save a few for himself. So when Adam sinned, you see, the Bible says God made man upright. Adam was born upright, mm -hmm. sinless. Mm -hmm. But God and they sought out many inventions. So after Adam sinned, everyone was cursed. And mm -hmm. God showed it, God had the right to throw everyone in hell. And man becomes haters when Adam sinned. They hated God. That's what he did. He rebelled. So God has a well, right to hate. He hates he. He's angry with the wicked every day. Right, but the, the so, Romans 9 passage, uh -huh. if we take it Calvinistically, uh, God hated Esau. He hasn't done a thing wrong yet. Well, he so has inherited Adam's nature. It's, but it, it is what it says. He, yeah. him, in Romans 9, that the, the boys haven't, having done no good or physically evil. Physically wrong. He didn't do something it, it physically. It does say that. But inherently, he was it, under sin. It does say, well. If, if that would be the case, then he would be the, man, the only man to born without sin. <laughs> um, Jesus said Jesus gives us some instructions in Matthew chapter 5 he says love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you 
Pray for those who use and persecute you, and you'll be sons of your Father. And then he says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Are we supposed to be more benevolent than God? Uh, The Bible says in Micah 7, verse 18, God delights in mercy, and there's rejoicing in the presence of angels over, over one sinner who repents. God's rejoicing over sinners who repent. Luke 6, 36 says, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Be merciful. So, he, tell, he gives us a parable in Luke chapter 10. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Remember the Good Samaritan parable? And, and the guy falls among the thieves, and he gets beaten with an inch of his life, and the Samaritan stops and helps that man who couldn't help himself. Jesus said in, in uh, Luke 10, 37, Go and do likewise. Now, that's the, that's the command we're, we're to believe that this reflects the nature and character of God. But on Calvinism, this is not what God is doing for the bulk of humanity. Get the force of that. I think there's something here to talk about. God says, help a guy that you can help. And we want to believe that God's moral commands reflect his morally perfect character. And yet on the Calvinist conception, the bulk of humanity, God will not help in that, in, in that way. They're going straight to hell. And I think that's not kind. And it's not merciful, and I don't think it's loving. And yet, uh, Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9 says that God, God is gracious, God is compassionate, God is good to all, and His mercies are over all His works. That doesn't jive with me with the Reformed position on this matter. I think I see an inconsistency here. I know, I can anticipate the response. <laughs> Doesn't God give shun, sunshine, rain, and crops to people, right? He makes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. I read Matthew sixteen twenty six. Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? A God's provision and his material blessings are not expressions of God's love in and of themselves. They're supposed to be witnesses to, to the existence of God and the nature and character of God, so that the goodness of God will lead to repentance. That's what Romans 2.4 says. That's the purpose of the sunshine and the rain and all the good stuff people get, so that the goodness of God will lead them to repentance. Yeah? Um, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So yeah. um, unconditional election is you're destined for either hell or heaven, no matter what you do, basically. I, I think the uh, predestination to hell is a corollary of the unconditional election to salvation. Yeah. Would that be right, Caleb? Yeah. Would that be the right way to say it? So, kind of just about that then? S- say again? So, kind of, you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell, but that's decided without really your input. Like Correct. No what you do. Correct. So I think that's, that is the reform position on the matter. Yeah. From that perspective, what need would there be for repentance if you're going to go somewhere no matter what, if you repent or not, what's the need for baptism and what's the need for priests to go out and share the word of God to convince people to make well, that decision? I think you should ask a reformed theologian. I think that the short answer would be God can govern man however he feels. It's up to God, right? He's sovereign. Uh, I'm just arguing, I don't think he's chosen to govern man that way. <laughs> but a reformed theologian uh, has a different opinion. So, I don't know if you want to add something to, to Zion's statement there. Well, I would just say no matter, like, regarding the repentance and salvation thing. Yeah. Lamp, our names are already in the Lamb Book of Life before the foundation of the world, mm-hmm. according to Revelation. That's, irregardless of your position on predestination, that is irrevocably true. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yes, we need to <clears throat> repent, but at the same time, our names were already in that book. Right? Mm-hmm. And there were people whose names weren't. And so that was already set before the creation of the world. So, like, from our perspective, yes, we need repentance. From our perspective, yes, we need salvation. But from God's perspective, again, irregardless of the predestination point, he already pre-knows who will repent and who will. For sure. On that one, I agree, 100%. Sorry, one more thing to add. Um, Isn't there also cases in the Bible where there is a man who is just who is even following uh, God's commandment and then loses favor with God and his salvation and then goes to hell. But then my question is, how can he lose something he didn't have to begin with? 
Uh, you're saying there's an account of a guy who was saved, who lost like, his salvation? In the, no, no, like, um, he's following the law. Where he's following the law, but, yeah, like where he's following uh, the path that he feels God like out for him. Uh-huh. But then he missteps and he ends up falling into depravity or sin. Okay. But, I mean, it's, like, we're... Like, where it's worded as he was a just man following the word of God, but then falls out of the path and then loses his salvation. So like multiple kings in Israel? Yeah, but how can he lose something he didn't have to begin with? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm one of those guys who thinks that if you come into a saving knowledge of Jesus and you're adopted into the family, you're not going to forfeit your salvation. The Savior is so great, he can keep you saved. And, um, but that's something we could talk about in more detail in the future. Can I just add a point? Sure, yeah. In agreement with you. Yeah. Um, but uh, a lot, like when these things happen in Scripture regarding, like, say, a lot of the kings of Israel who were just and then abandoned, let's say King Saul, who had the Spirit of God in him, and God removed his spirit from Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 16, I believe it is. He's not losing his salvation. He's losing his covenant status. He's losing the protection of God. That's what happened to Israel during the time of Isaiah. God, uh, he preserved a remnant in the end, but he killed a bunch of Israelites under Assyria. Would it be he's losing the covenant status, or the covenant is just applying because it's when you disobey God, the covenant says he'll be cursed? Yeah. So if he lost his covenant status, then he would be fine. Uh, I think this discussion, we're yeah, sort of ranging separate. way beyond. Yeah. So. <laughs> How about we hold that for after we pray? We'll close. Is there any other top, like Questions, comments directly related to this yeah, stuff. Yeah, so John, that you were talking about uh, the, wor the world, the call of the world, and you gave a lot of scriptures. Yeah. In John 12, 9, yeah. uh, right after you raised Lazarus, and, and the people were just flacking Jesus, the people in that area. Yeah. And then the first thing we'll say in John 12, 9 is, look, the whole world has gone after him. Yeah. You see, the word world is not used the same in every sense. Oh, yeah. It was just that group of people around you were going okay. after him. That wasn't the whole world. For sure. Context matters. Context really does matter. These people were absolutely dismayed to see this. All these people flocking after Jesus, and they, they use hyperbole, right? The whole world's gone after this person. But when the Bible multiplies references over and over and over again, it's probably trying to tell us something. What if Jesus really did die for the sins of the world? How else do you think he should say it other than exactly. he is the propitiation not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world? But he said, I pray not for the whole world. He does pray for the world. Has given me. Read, please, John 17 again. Yeah. Uh, you touched on Esau. Yeah. But, you know, is the explanation, are you going to be covering that? In I will, process? in detail. That's to keep you on the hook, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in my prepared notes here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Let's, uh, let's close it off in prayer at 58 minutes. <laughs> okay. Our dear, blessed, holy God of heaven, thank you. Uh, dear Lord, the lover of our souls, we're so grateful for you, for your presence, for your Bible. And uh, Lord... I confess, in, in, uh, the Bible's not an easy book. Not for me, probably not for anyone, really. But, uh, Lord, we thank and praise you that you do walk with us and you do open the scriptures to us. A word in season. And, uh, Lord, thank you. Even though there is disagreement here over some things, we can feel love and unity still. And we're grateful, Lord, that we can walk that, that uh, razor's edge here in this class. So thank you, Lord, for that grace also. And we want to recommit ourselves and our cares to you and your tender mercies. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Praise God. Okay, God bless you all. You're certainly welcome to hang around and visit. <laughs>